these people were very obnoxious, atrocious, called him names, didn't want to accept Allah, complete kuffar, arrogant, everything. And then, you know, um, and he was a prophet who used to speak to Allah. So he went there and, and, and spoke to Allah and said, Allah, you know, these people are not worth living. You know, really, these are obnoxious people. They are atrocious people. I mean, you know, there are some people who are so bad that you wish they didn't even exist. It was like that. So, and his prophet Musa, so his request was not out of emotions. He really looked at them and said, these are really bad people and they shouldn't be existing. They will hurt others. And so he told that to Allah that, um, is it possible to, to erase them, to get rid of them? So Allah, uh, he told Prophet Musa that, um, Musa, uh, you have a tree, don't you, that you planted? So yes. And, and um, do you like that tree? So yes. So what happens if uh, someone were to get rid of it? cut it down and Musa said I would feel bad and he said why why would you feel bad and Musa said because I I work on it I mean I put people on it for it and Allah told him just like you cared for your tree and you love it The same way and more than that, I love my creation. I worked on them. I created them. I spent time on them. I don't like to see them finished. I don't like to see them destroyed. Just like you love your tree, I love my creation. Which brings us to our subject, Allah's love. And what does that love have to do with us? Really, look at what that love is and how it is. And based on that, how should we view Allah? These are certain things that we want to get into today and inshallah help us to as the title says build a relationship with our master and our creator my friends what does Allah's love mean for us his love is known through the fact that he created us he made us he made us. It is known through that. You know, let me ask you a very harsh question. And my apologies for being so upfront with this question. But this is just to provoke your thoughts and make you think. If uh, you were told by your parents that, you know, you were actually a mistake. We didn't actually want to have you. But unfortunately, we did. It was just an accident. Tell me how far would that go to break you? To destroy you? To hurt you deep inside? It's, it's really, wow, that would be like a life changer. We would lose so much of ourselves to know that we are a mistake. To know that we are an accident. My friends, Allah did not create us by accident. Allah did not make us uh, because we were some experiment. 
there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of care that went into it. To Allah, everything that he has created is special. And he cares for it, each and everything. Just for us to know that we are not an accident, that the one who made us, created us, actually cares for us, and is interested in our growth, and is really looking forward to our success, truly is what is going to give our life inspiration, true inspiration, not one of those temporary fixes, real inspiration. It will uplift us knowing that, wow, I am loved. Someone loves me. Someone actually cares for me. This is, this love of Allah is truly what makes us whole. What makes us know that, wow, I, I mean, I have value, I'm precious. Because there's someone, the creator is caring for me. He loves me. And this is where we start. This is where we start. You know, my friends, a lot of questions that I want to answer here, for example, how does Allah tell us He loves us? How would we know? This is the Mohaban. Do we have to do something in response in order to make Allah love us more? A lot of these things need to be part of. So I'm just going to say a few things here in regards to this you know first of all when allah created us it is enough proof to know that he loves us and he cares for us and our creation is not a mistake it's not an accident the second thing that you want to know is that who is allah looking at when he looks down all the people who are here in this gathering right now and you all are behind your computers or your iPhones or, or, or your phones. Who do you think Allah is looking at? Who do you think that Allah is, is talking to? You know who? You can say, well, he's looking at us. No, he's not looking at us. You know, he's looking at me. Not me, me as in you. The individual you. Each and every one of us. Individually, he's looking at me. Allah has a personal relationship with each and every one of you. All of us. But individually. Not like, oh, all of you together, you know. It's not like parents, for example, who have like 15 kids, you know, and, and they hardly remember their names. It's like, no, more than that. Each and every one of us is important for him. So how does Allah express his love for us? Did you ever thought about that? How does he tell you that he loves you? You should know that he does tell you that he loves you. But maybe you haven't paid attention to his language. Maybe you haven't paid attention to his method. Maybe you haven't actually noticed him say that. But Allah embraces each and every one of us and whispers in our ears, that I love you. How does he do that? You know, the expression of Allah's love 
is known through commandments. Commandments. Yes. The same wajib and haram. When he says do or don't, this is an expression of Allah's love for us. Every time he says that, he is saying, I love you. My friends, um, if you, uh, if your dad sees the neighbor's kid do something wrong, is your dad going to go and get upset and, and, and talk to the neighbor's kids? And sit them down and says, you know, I, I saw you do this and, and, and speak to them? No, he won't. He won't. He just look at them and says, man, that's terrible. Well, look at that. He'll just feel bad. But if you did the same wrong, and if you did the same mistake, is he going to treat you like the neighbor's kids? Or is he going to take it seriously and actually going to come to you and talk to you and, and, and discuss it with you? You know, when you love someone, then you actually put responsibility on their shoulders. You make things watch it. Obligations come about when there's love. When there's low love, no. I, I, what's your relationship with me? Nothing. You can't tell me what to do. But if a lover tells his, his beloved to do something, uh, the beloved doesn't ask the lover, how dare you say something? You know, who do you think you are? It doesn't happen. I mean... The lover and the beloved will be like so happy that if you ask them to do something, if you ever have been in love, you would know this. If you ever have loved someone, you would know this, that if they ask you for something, doing it is a pleasure. It's like, wow, she asked me for something. You know, he asked me to do something. When you love someone, it's a pleasure doing it. Wow, I am waiting for the command to come down. Commandments are the, the, the expression how Allah says, I love you. Fasting is an example. In the month of Ramadan, Allah comes to us and says, you know, I really, I really love you. That's why I have made fasting wajib on you. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq has said that fasting was not made wajib on the nations before. On the nations before, Allah has uh, pointed out the Muslim nation and, and said that I have made it wajib on you. Someone from the companions of Imam Sadiq says, but the ayat says that Allah has prescribed it for you just like he has prescribed it for those before you. That's what the ayat says, right? So he asked the imam about the ayat. And the imam says that before the Muslim nation, Allah did not make it wajib on the people. He made it wajib on anbiya only, on the prophets. But he loved this nation so much that he made it wajib on you, on the Muslim world. Yes, held you in special rank. That's when Allah makes it wajib. Tell me, is uh, namaz e shab, salatul layl? Right? If he loved you a little bit more, if he thought that you were better, he would have made it wajib. That's why it's wajib on Rasulullah. Rasulullah, namaz e shab was wajib because he was capable of it. This is how Allah expresses his love for the people. It is through his commandments. Our imams have said, Imam Sadiq has said, you know, whenever Allah gives a command, the bitterness of, of doing it, because it's, it's taklif, it's a burden, right? To do it is gone. It, it, it's not found 
or it has no effect on me by the way Allah has called the people. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Oh, you who believe. Allah called me a believer when he made it wajib or made something haram. It's, wow. That's how it is. Allah makes it like that. I'll give an example. You know, uh, I don't want to go too far off the speech, but just an example so that it can make sense to you. You know, Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura had asked everyone to leave. He says, you all don't need to be killed. There's going to be a battle and they're going to come and kill me. You all don't need to be killed. So you all go. He told his companions and everyone, just leave me. You don't have to die. I will die today. You don't have to die. And he told everyone, just go, just go, just go. But there's one person that Imam Hussein asked that person to stay. He says, you stay with me. I don't want you to go. And one person, he said, stay with me. And you know, imagine, for example, if you were there and Imam Hussein asked everyone to leave except for you. And he asked you, pointed you out in the midst of the crowd and said, can you please stay? How would you feel? How important will you feel? How special would you feel that Imam Hussein is asking me? I mean, of all of everyone asking me. That's, my friends, one person he asked us. Everyone he said, go. But that one person was Zainab. He says, Zainab, I want you to stay here. I need you. And that's when Zainab was willing to go through anything because Hussein has asked me for this. This is the pleasure that a person gets when someone who is loved gives a command. It's a pleasure behind it. And that's how Allah expresses his love to us. You know, um, disobedience to Allah Sins, guna, leads to the hellfire. Do you know why? Why does sin lead to hellfire? Why is there so harsh a punishment for a sin? You know, hellfire is not easy. It is, you know, you don't even want to imagine it. It's that bad. How is it that a measly old sin has led someone to the hellfire. How can that be? You know why? It's because of Allah's love. That's why. You know, it's like, for example, if you are disobedient to your mother, or for example, if you're insulted, to your mother, I mean, they were all ugly. So how can you say these things about your mother? She is your mother. You know that? She loves you. You see, that's why if you insult anyone else, it's different than insulting your mother. Because your mother loves you. And everyone knows that. Just to even think about it is ugly. That's why person is going to go to hell because it's not that you were disobedient you were disobedient to the one who loves you more than anyone else who actually cared for you no one else cared for you no one else cared for you and he cared for you my friends you know there is a group of people uh, who are going to get the most severest punishment in hell there's a uh, comment that says, you know, they want to ask questions. You can write your questions in the chat and I'm going to get to them. Right? Just go ahead and you can write the questions in the chat and I'll get to them at the end. Um, the severest punishment on the Day of Judgment. You know who it's meant for? The severest, the most harshest punishment is meant for the killers of the Imams. Those who killed the Imams are going to get the harshest 
punishment on the day of judgment not in hellfire on the day of judgment what is that what is the punishment that they're going to get that's going to be so bad that even the news of hell is not going to bother them i mean they will be told you're going to go to hell here's the hellfire go there and and, and these people will be like, I don't care. Because the punishment they're going through will be so bad. You know what will that be? That punishment will be that Allah will refuse to talk to them on the day of judgment. These criminals, Yazid, Omar ibn Saad, Shemr, all of them will be saying, okay, we're going to go to hell, but why is he not talking to us? At least let him tell us that, you know, you all are criminals. You are going to go to hell. We just want to hear his voice. We just want him to talk to us. On the day of judgment, you will realize how much Allah loved him. Even those criminals will be like, I don't care if I go to hell, but why is he not talking to us? That will be worse than going to hell. This is Allah's love. Just absorb that. And, and understand that how much that means the wrong idea of Allah in our minds the wrong idea that people have in their mind is that Allah is like a, a police or a judge and because of that they're unable to build a relationship with Allah if you think that Allah is a, a police trying to catch criminals or a judge who's waiting to make judgment against criminals, you will never build a relationship with Allah. Shaitan wants you to think that. He doesn't want you to know that Allah loves you. He doesn't want you to know that, or doesn't want you to think in those terms. You see, what happens if you are a criminal, and we all are criminals, we all have done wrong. If we view Allah as a, a cop, then we would try to hide from him, not build a relationship with him. Because he's a cop. He's after criminals and I'm a criminal. We'll be running away from judges because we know that, you know what? The judge is going to find me guilty. I will have a guilty conscience. And having a guilty conscience, I will not be able to build a relationship. The only way a criminal, the only person a criminal can build a relationship with is with someone who loves him like his mother. A criminal will run to his mother because he will know that no matter if the whole world refuses to forgive him, but his mother is the only place that he can go to where he can find forgiveness. And that is Allah. If a person knows how Allah is and how much he loves us, then you know what? Even though we are criminals, that's the only place we know that we can find refuge in. We can find refuge in that. And that's why, you know, it, it is uh, Imam Bakr al-Islam said this, that uh, regarding uh, Imam Hussein, he said that on the day of Ashura, when Imam Hussein was being killed, when he was on the ground and being killed, Allah spoke to Imam Hussein. And he told him that Hussein, whether you die today, whether you become Shaheed today, or you don't become Shaheed today, I love you either way. You becoming Shaheed is not going to increase my love for you. My friends, Allah's love for us is not going to grow if we become better. You know, Allah loves us. That just realizing His love is what's going to make us grow. Knowing that He loves us is what's going to make us grow internally. It's going to make us someone who has a person who's completely confident about himself. Knowing that he's cared for, that he's loved. This is just the idea that we 
when we want to build ourselves, Allah's love is that which helps us to build ourselves. I'm going to get to the questions now. Those people who asked uh, questions, let me uh, see. Right, so we have one question I see in the chat right now. It says, question for Sheikh, is there a special dua for the feeling of hopelessness? Okay, uh, you see, first, um, first of all, again, uh, hopelessness is a direct result of uh, not knowing and not understanding that Allah loves us. A lot of people don't look at it that way. They think that they're being avoided. You know, just because, for example, a, a, a father, you know, is trying to discipline his children, uh, doesn't speak to him, uh, doesn't mean that he doesn't love him. It's only because he loves him, he's doing that. So the worst sin that a person can do that Allah has spoken of in the Quran is La taknatum rahmatullah. Do not despair of Allah's mercy. Do not despair of his mercy and his compassion. He is uh, the last refuge we have, the first refuge we have, the only refuge we have. I tell you that your parents will leave you. But if you can understand that, you know what? They just gave me birth. They're not my creators. My creator hasn't left me. A person will find himself and he will find not just hope, but he will find his purpose and recognize his value. Recognize his value. You know, um, let me add something over here. Belonging. As a human being, it is in our nature to belong somewhere, to have an identity. You know, like I have an, I, I belong somewhere. You know, like it's, it's for, that's why for all human beings, Citizenship is very important. Citizenship shows that I belong to a country, a nation. This is where I belong to. It gives me an identity. It fulfills a recognition for me. It's, it's in our nature. We all want to belong somewhere. And, and the reason and, and citizenship, what does it do? It brings about burden and obligation that if I belong to a nation, then I'm obligated to defend that nation, to, to look after it, to work for its success. And if we can find and everyone Every nation can deport you, get rid of you, whatever you can. But the one nation and the one place that you always belong to is Allah. He's not going to get rid of you. And he has said that. No matter how bad a person is, it doesn't matter. We have in the hadith, in the duas we have, that Allah, even though my sins are great, but your mercy is greater. All right. Um, so we have another question. The, it says, why did Allah create the COVID-19 disease if he loves us so much? All right. Uh, the COVID-19 disease. Um, again, you know, we don't know who made it, where it came from. But still, uh, Allah does send... Um, debt to mankind just like he sends life to mankind 
And just like life is a mercy, death is also a mercy. Life here in this world, death is not the ending of life. Death is the ending of life in this garbage that we're living in. That's the only place that death is, and it's a mercy. It is a great mercy of Allah to give death. You know, what happens when a person doesn't die? He will become so miserable in his life, in his old age, that truly he is just living in a constant perpetual depression. You know, whenever anyone outlasts everyone else in their life, meaning you see that these people who live for 110 years and 120 years or something like that, you know what they're living with? They're living with the fact that everyone that they cared for and loved for are dead. Everyone that they knew in life are dead. They are lonely. It's not fun living like that. So death is a mercy in so many ways. I'm just giving you an angle or two to look at. If you ponder, you will see how beautiful and how merciful is death. But obviously not with our own hands. It comes from Allah. That's why Allah says that he is the one who gives life and gives death. And both of them are blessings that we have. And our death will come at the most opportune time for us that we don't know of. But Allah is going to do that. So uh, the death comes in different shapes and forms. Sometimes it comes as a war and a battle. Sometimes it comes violently. Sometimes it comes in bed. Sometimes it comes as a disease and cancer or flu. It doesn't matter what shape and form it takes. It's going to happen. It's an eventuality. You can't escape it. No matter what you do, you can't escape it. So, gives a uh, form of death that has come to a lot of people at the same time, it becomes a sign. When individual death was not enough to remind you of your own death, then Allah gives a I'm going also. It doesn't matter. We all have to go. So it's not uh, something bad. It's something that is natural. It's natural. At, in Akhirah Zaman, in the end times, that there will be two types of mass death that will take place. There will be uh, the the red death and the white death. The red death is through war and the white death is through disease. It's going to be massive and many people will die from that. But that is, that's Allah who does that. But yes, you know, if, if, if mankind has done something to that, then there are culprits. They should be brought to justice. If this COVID-19 was made by someone and, and, and they did these things, then obviously they are criminals and they should do that. And then they should be punished for it. But if it comes from Allah, then obviously death is only through Allah. Allah is the only one who has the right to take our life from here and take it over there to the next world. Thank you, Maulana, for uh, addressing these questions regarding responsibility and their deeper meanings in Islam. Uh, we have a few more questions, but before I had one of my own. So you talked about yeah. how hell comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Uh, how does Islam explain the concept of eternal hell? 
for punishments that are quite obviously not eternal, for crimes that are quite, quite obviously not eternal. All right, very good. Uh, let me tell you this, you know, um, there's hadith from Imam Bakr salam who said that um, a moment, a believer's rewards are greater than his actions. And uh, not Unbelievers' punishment is greater than the principle here. You see, a believer who wants to worship Allah, it starts praying. And he starts to pray for an hour, two hour, three hour, you know, he starts praying. And he wants to pray all night long. But you know, his physical limitation stop him. After a while, he just gets tired. He doesn't, he can't go on anymore. So what happens? Allah sees his intention. If he was given the ability to pray forever, he would be praying forever. He would be doing good forever. So Allah will reward him forever. A kafir wants to disobey Allah. And he goes on disobeying him. For example, he goes to the bar, gets a drink, two drinks, three drinks, until he gets drunk. But you know what? The only thing that stops him is his physical limitation. He will throw up. After a while, he can't drink anymore because of his physical limitation. But he wants, his intention is to disobey Allah forever. So Allah will base his punishment on his intention. You, the only thing that stops you from disobeying is your own physical limitation. Otherwise, you would have disobeyed me forever. And this is what's going to become clear to those people on the Day of Judgment. That yes, I would have disobeyed Allah forever. And uh -huh. that's how it happened. Thank you. We have a few more free questions, but we're kind of running short on time. So I believe we have time for one or two more questions and we'll have to wrap it up. So one of the questions I see here is, uh, how do we please our parents while at the same time not overburdening ourselves with systemic duties? All right, very good. Listen, you know, uh, I think, you know, I'm speaking to youth here, right? Basically youth here. Is it right that I'm speaking to youngsters, young adults? Then since I have your attention here, let me say a few things, right? Um, you know, um, youth, youngsters, one of the things that is hated that Rasulullah used who was lazy, who would not work. Youngsters, people who are young are supposed to be hardworking. They're supposed to be people who don't get tired. They have all the energy, they have the youth. Unfortunately, uh, here in America, they have been raised in a very bad way by their parents. Rasulullah has said, woe on those children of the end times and their parents who will raise them without discipline. Right, right. Another place, it is said that um, one of the signs of the end times is that the children of believers are going to be filthy garbage, better to be thrown out. My friends, communities should not cater to the youth. It is the youth who should cater to the communities. If a youngster sits down there and lets an elder serve him, 
there's a curse on that youngster. He should never allow some elder to work for him. He should be the one getting up and saying, no, you please, you sit, let me do the work. You have done enough. This is the attitude of a youngster. That's what makes him Shabab. That's what makes him no Jawan. Jawan Mard. Jawan Mardi is that. He would not allow someone who is an elder to work while he's sitting there. I'm I'm the Jawan here. I need to be doing this. Imagine, for example, if Imam Hussein was serving Ali Akbar or Qasim. You know, they would die of shame if they let Imam Hussein or any elder do any work. They wouldn't do that. Their, their, their Jawan Mardi will not allow it to happen. And this is the reason for youngsters here, when you look at your parents or any elder for that matter in the masjid anywhere, you should be the one. And that's what makes a man out of you. Not just a man, but a, a, an adult. Because you have that in your heart. You're big hearted. You are young. You have all the energy. You can play basketball for hours and not get tired. How is it that you're unable to do work or serve elders even for, you know, a couple of minutes? There is a lesson here of, of growth. And I want you all to think about that. You know, growth really happens in the right way, not in these sort of ways. So when you, for example, say that you should find it a blessing for your parents. Do that. The only time, yes, you don't serve your parents is when you have to serve Allah. Meaning that when Allah has to be served, that's different. Then obviously Allah says you do what Allah says and then you go back to your parents. But other than that, as youngsters, you all should be now taking the burden of doing the things. That's what makes you special. You are the future. And you want to be the ones who want to take that burden on you. You should be proud of taking it. Any burden that comes to you, Allah gave you the power to do that. You know, when you get white hair like mine and diabetes and all of these things, you know, you might want to do good deeds or good things, but you know what? You would not have the either the energy or the power to do it. And you wish you were young again so you can do more. I guess that's it. We will end it over here. Uh, if there's some, anything else, inshallah, we will uh, see how we can. Thank you very much, Maulana, for your enlightening speech and your advice. Uh, we're glad to have you today and yesterday as well. Um, and helping us understand basically the deeper meanings behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and why he bestows upon us certain responsibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maulana. I really appreciate it. We, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in the next week, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. The dates I have, I will see you all. Inshallah. Thank, Thank you so much. And to the audience, I'm aware uh, we have a few more questions, but we're kind of running short on time, so we couldn't address everything today. Uh, program is supposed to end at 7.45, it's 7.55 right now. Uh, but for everyone left, we have programs more coming. We have another program tomorrow, a book club. Uh, so please uh, feel free to attend. Good programs, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you.